I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of The Listening Post. Much of the news that you've seen as 2014 drew to a close was retrospective, looking back at the year that was. We're going to start 2015 looking forward at where some of the big stories involving media and journalism are going. China, the emerging superpower, is fine-tuning its global media machine, a key tool in its soft power push. 18 months into the story of Edward Snowden versus the NSA, journalists are changing the way they do business. More and more of them are encrypting their communications to keep sources safe, and the news outlets that those journalists work for are going mobile. 2015 will see more and more news companies aiming their content away from your television sets and at your handsets. But we start with Russia, which enters the new year in the middle of a geopolitical minefield in Ukraine. The airwaves over Eastern Europe are thick with nationalistic rhetoric coming out of both Moscow and Kiev, and some Russian media outlets that have reported critically on President Putin's policies are now paying the price for that. The Kremlin is also bulking up its formidable array of media weaponry and spending a lot of rubles doing it. The effects of a new law restricting media ownership by foreigners have yet to be felt, but more media will be in Russian hands as the year goes on. Throw in a currency crisis that domestic media blame on the West, and it's clear. Russia and its media are heading into an eventful 2015. Russia spent much of 2014 in the headlines, and one of those stories was the state of the domestic news media working under the Kremlin's watch. The crisis over Ukraine was in its early stages when a radio station, Echo Moskvi, and Lenta.ru, the country's most popular news website, both had their editors replaced by journalists with connections to state-owned media. The independent TV channel, Dozhd, provided some critical coverage of Ukraine and was soon dumped by Russian cable carriers, losing 90% of its viewers. Then, foreign-owned media outlets saw the rules change through a new law limiting foreign ownership to 25%. Many Russians say that law was drawn up for Viedomosti, a financial paper part-owned by Dow Jones and the Financial Times, known for its tough coverage of the government and the oligarchs with whom the Kremlin does business. That law really does have very direct implications for us. It was passed very quickly without discussion, without sufficient justification. There's simply the impression that it's not good for foreigners to control the media. This year has been a year of condemnation of everything foreign. A politically expedient moment was chosen for the introduction of this law. It is clear that the limits imposed on the capital speaks to the kind of political concerns of the Kremlin, but also its financial concerns, because the share of the market that's going to be traded off by foreign investors will probably go into Russian hands. The Kremlin under Vladimir Putin also has its own media ambitions. Rossiya Sigodnia is a news agency founded by presidential decree and headed by polarizing figure and Putin favorite Dmitry Kiselyov. Two months ago, another news agency, the international multimedia platform Sputnik, was launched. Its stated aim to counter what the Kremlin calls the global media's anti-Russian bias. Russia, Sigodnia and Sputnik are focused on an international audience, and I think they have more to do with the deterioration in the international situation for Russia. This really is a part of the state's policy. The state needs to be better at projecting its policies to an international audience. In many ways, this is what President Putin articulated a decade ago. That was his goal, to establish uh, the presence of Russian media globally and give them more structure in the new kind of a media empire that the Kremlin is trying to build around the world. Russia beyond the headlines is part of that push. Its paid supplements already appear in newspapers such as the Washington Post and the New York Times. And while it's only partly funded by the Russian government, its media objectives sound much like the Kremlin's. You know, we are pushing uh, Russian official political agenda. We are trying to report more about Russia, to shed light on the stories and people that don't get enough coverage in foreign media. And we are trying to, uh, to build bridges with, uh, with these foreign audiences. We think that Russia is seriously underreported in foreign media, and we want to close this gap. 
We understand that foreign audience and modern foreign audience is reading, watching, uh, listening to all sorts of content on all of the platforms. And that's why we have to, to be there uh, to tell them more about Russia. However, the centerpiece of Russia's soft power media push remains RT, the news network formerly known as Russia Today. 2014 saw RT get a significant boost in funding, and it spun off a new news channel for British audiences. But RT UK has already been warned by media regulators in Britain for its biased coverage. I think RT has been very successful at trying to determine kind of gaps in Western discourse, particularly between the promises and actual acts of governments and countries. At the same time, RT actually does not have its own agenda. It's never clear what it stands for and what kind of interests it represents. It's very difficult to pin down and it's very mobile in its views. RT speaks to um, you know, a very left-wing audience, but also a very conservative audience at the same time. And I think this is one of the reasons why people might be interested in this TV channel. With Russia facing a ruble crunch and economic troubles at home, both related to its confrontations with the West, the stakes in this media war are very high. And you can expect that the big battle in 2015 will continue to be over the future and the story of Ukraine. What we see now is that everyone, I'm talking about everyone, Russians, Americans, Europeans, everyone is sort of uh, wearing uh, Cold War goggles right now. And it's very bad for the communication between nations. So what we are trying to do and uh, what I guess all other media has to do is try to show more of the shades of situation, to provide more context and to ask relevant questions, to get to the roots of the situation, to get to the core of the conflicts. The most dangerous thing that has happened this year in the Russian media is not the neutralization of the independent media, but these seeds of hostility that have been sown among our people. For political reasons, Russian state media has spent all year appealing to people's emotions to elicit hatred and anger, particularly at critical moments connected with Crimea and Ukraine. The reach and influence of broadcast TV and the media that is controlled by the state is incomparably vast alongside independent news outlets. Nobody in our country can stand up to the state propaganda machine. In terms of sheer scale, the number of news outlets, the size of audiences, the number of citizens online, the number of handsets, there is no media story like China. 2015 will see President Xi Jinping's second full year at the helm of the People's Republic, and he's already started implementing some of his major domestic media reforms. There's a tough and high-profile anti-graft campaign underway, and some big-name journalists have been among those accused of taking bribes in return for favorable news coverage. And the authorities in Beijing are trying to massage their own image among China's web users, spreading positive messages about the party online. The Great Firewall is still there. Just a few days ago, it was reported that Google's email service had been blocked in China. For foreign media outlets, not much has changed. International reporters still struggle to get the necessary work permits. The Listening Post's Guri Sharma now on what we can expect from the world's biggest media market in the year ahead. One of President Xi Jinping's key policies has been what he calls the Chinese dream concept. It's a policy push that he wants Chinese media to participate in. To quote, spread positive energy to create a harmonious Chinese society. There was uh, a lot of things that happened in the media industry in China in, in, in the past year. The government definitely tried to deal with the reactions from uh, not just the, the traditional media or foreign media, but more about, uh, you know, from the social media. Xi Jinping hosted this um, very high profile and influential um, conference with bloggers, filmmakers, writers in Beijing trying to co-opt some of the popular bloggers, hoping that these people are the opinion leaders on the internet and what they say and the position they take can be very influential. Beijing's aggressive anti-corruption driver 2014 targeted not just politicians, but journalists as well. A number of reporters at a leading financial website 
21 CBH, were arrested amid accusations that they tried to extort money from companies in return for positive stories. CCTV, the country's largest state-owned outlet, was hit hard too. Among those put under investigation in 2014 were prominent TV host Rui Chenggeng and his boss at the network's financial news site, Guo Zhenji. Some people say this is only creating chilling effect. Um, this is only a way to sort of um, silence some of the more um, liberal-leaning media. But I think this also shows that the problem with Chinese media, for some journalists, they're not really in pursuit of truth, they're rather in pursuit of, of money. According to the US-based Committee to Protect Journalists, a record number of reporters, 44, were put behind bars in 2014. Some of the interrogations and arrests took place in public, on TV. Back in May, a veteran journalist, Gao Yu, was put on air where she confessed to leaking state secrets to foreign news outlets, including Germany's Deutsche Welle. That was followed by freelance journalist Yang Nanhu, who said he had made up facts for stories he provided to foreign websites. Beijing has different methods to manage and control the foreign media. Journalists with the New York Times, Reuters and Al Jazeera have struggled to get visas and the New York Times' website remains blocked in the country. President Xi Jinping isn't mincing words. In a press conference with President Obama two months ago, he said journalists and media outlets need to obey China's laws and regulations. 2015 will continue to be a very difficult year for foreign media in China. The People's Daily, which is the Communist Party's mouthpiece recently, made New York, the New York Times as a sort of a case study. And the title for the commentary is called uh, NYT, do damage to yourself, to the world, and to the society. It was like for the first time, the People's Daily picked up on one single foreign media organization and wrote a very lengthy piece to explain to Chinese readers um, how basically how, how bad the NYT is. So this sent a very clear signal that uh, the problem between NYT or media organizations like NYT uh, in China will just continue. Events in Hong Kong this year made headlines around the world, but less so on mainland China. The story was downplayed, and Beijing was accused of trying to suppress coverage of the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong's media as well. 2015 will be a year for China to continue pursuing its global media ambitions and its campaign to present a counter to what it sees as a demonizing narrative pushed by foreign media. Effort to regain and maintain control would probably only intensify um, in the year to come. And again, it's not just about suppressing certain information there would be probably even more sophisticated effort trying to um, promote the kind of information that they think would be positive. 2015 will be some interesting years uh, for us to see how fast the Chinese media organization expand outside China. Well, I understand CCTV has been hiring in Africa or in Hong Kong, even the People's Daily is also thinking about you know, how they can expand their uh, influence uh, beyond just mainland China. And Xinhua, and the official news agency, has done a lot of things on Western social media like Facebook and Twitter. It, it's a clear signal that with Beijing's efforts to improve the, the image of China, China has an intelligence agency known as the MSS. Russia has the FSB. The United States has the CIA and the NSA, among its 18 intelligence services. If there's one thing that Edward Snowden taught journalists when he leaked all those NSA files, it's that in this age of mass surveillance, reporters face unprecedented challenges to shield their work from prying eyes and protect their sources. In the name of national security, governments around the world harvest huge quantities of metadata every day, intercepting and eavesdropping on communications, tracking movements, and bulk collecting phone records. 
The implications for privacy rights are serious. The consequences for investigative journalism potentially ruinous. In order to keep producing critical and sometimes adversarial reporting, especially on issues of national security, journalists have learned that becoming more tech savvy is part of the job description. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on digital security in 2015 and how it should be at the top of the journalistic agenda. When Edward Snowden first contacted journalist Glenn Greenwald to go public about the NSA surveillance program, one of his first demands was to secure their communications. What followed was a crash course in encryption. For Greenwald, The Guardian, the paper he worked for at the time, and the journalism industry in general. The problem with government surveillance is that it's a silent threat. There is almost no detectability. This is one of the reasons that journalists and, and people sometimes don't take it seriously enough because you don't know exactly when you're being spied on. When journalists start to become aware that they were targets for this type of surveillance, many people hadn't been thinking usefully about security and privacy for very long at all. We're starting to see a maturity of thought. Journalists are starting to understand what security measures they need. This is crucial that those journalists who are investigative journalists learn about digital security, that's crucial. Because there is no way to protect data, there is no way to protect information if we don't learn digital security. In the 18 months since the Snowden story broke, more and more journalists have started protecting their communications, using undetectable web browsers like Tor and email encryption programs like PGP. News organizations are catching on as well. Many now offer SecureDrop, a digital drop box that allows sources and whistleblowers to submit confidential documents and data securely. But there's still a significant amount of institutional work to be done by media organizations. Individual journalists that I know, particularly those that report on the national security and, and technology, have, have really been quite impressive in terms of adopting operational security measures, secure communication tools. However, I think that media organizations um, as, as conglomerates are really not moving as quickly. It would be irresponsible for a news organization or a journalist to tell a source with an absolute guarantee that they could keep their communications private. Basically, all hardware is vulnerable to surveillance implants. We are living in a big brother society report. The Snowden revelations blew the whistle on surveillance programs in the US and the UK. But the trend is not limited to those countries. During the Arab Spring, a Moroccan citizen journalist group, Mamfa Kinch, was targeted by its own government. A Vietnam-based journalist at the Associated Press and many local bloggers were victims of malware attacks, alleged to be the work of the Vietnamese government. In Turkey, major cyber attacks compromised the websites of a number of popular newspapers and news agencies. And in the digital world, there is no safe distance. An Ethiopian news outlet called ESAT, based in the DC area, accuses the government in Addis Ababa of breaking into its systems. There's a lot of sort of companies that have sprung up that you know, sell this capability to countries that they don't have a Silicon Valley, they find this capability desirable and have money. There's been a, a flow of surveillance equipment from both the US and, and Europe into the Middle East, for sure. There are a lot of cases in the world. You can see cases in Mexico, you can see cases in Angola, you can see cases in Syria, in Iran, uh, in Ecuador. So there are a lot of cases of uh, surveillance, attacks to online publications, uh, threats conducted via email, uh, defamation campaigns using social media like Twitter or Facebook. Where is this story going? Journalists are trained to follow the money. News budgets are shrinking and encryption and other security measures are just another cost of doing journalistic business. But surveillance is a growth industry. And with the Washington Post reporting that the US government spends more than $11 billion a year in collecting data, news organizations have a fight on their hands, a fight they cannot afford to lose. Ever since the advent of the printing press, technology has driven change in the media. The past few years have taught us that mobile gadgets in the hands of news consumers can be just as powerful 
as the technology behind news production in the mainstream media. Conventional news outlets are struggling with the evolutionary process. They need to adapt just to keep up with the devices in our pockets and the ways we use them. The Internet used to be a place for legacy outlets, big-name newspapers, for example, to simply reproduce their front pages digitally. But that just doesn't cut it anymore. Big media need to acquaint themselves with a host of new online platforms to deliver the news stories we're interested in, in the form that we want, whenever and wherever we want them. The Listening Post's Will Young now on some of the shifts we're seeing in news technology and audience engagement, and some of the changes we'll be seeing in the year to come. Traditionally speaking, journalists and editors decide what news is fit to print. But consumer technology, and in particular mobile, is gradually giving news consumers the choice, not just of what news they want, but when, where and how they want it delivered. Previously, we in the news industry have believed that we sit in between the reader or the viewer and decide what they're going to watch and how they're going to watch it. And I think what's happened with social is this idea that you, the reader, or you, the viewer, now are closer to the content, closer to the story. While technology opens up new possibilities and markets, it also presents media outlets with the challenge of making them paying propositions. In the new media ecosystem, increasingly centred around a mobile-enabled, millennial market, some outlets have evolved more quickly and more effectively than others. Companies like Wise and BuzzFeed and Vox Media were able to attract significant revenue from venture funds and other media companies. They don't have to worry about putting a daily newspaper, and I think their ability to kind of really sync technology with content is much better. What they have really grasped very quickly is the tone and the voice and the edge and how to talk to other people like them. But they also are doing some very good journalism and the younger people, as younger people always, um, are interested in serious things. The army has just turned off an APC. The success of digital upstarts has not been lost on the legacy outlets either. Deep-pocketed News Corporation was ahead of the curve when it bought a piece of Vice back in 2013. You'll get the whole picture, the whole time. This past year, the Washington Post and The Guardian have launched mobile apps that they hope will help them tap into the trend towards more accessible, more personalised content. And Reuters, a news agency with more than 160 years history is moving with the times, introducing an app for bundling news that's designed to reach a new generation of mobile users. Reuters TV, which is a personalised, uh, curated uh, news experience for mobile devices, is absolutely response to, we believe, a new demographic of consumers who live their lives through connected devices and demand today to stay informed on their terms. It's your news when you want it. Wherever you are in the news media, the future is mobile. Analysts say 2015 could see the number of smartphones top the 2 billion mark globally, making up over 80% of internet usage. And it's emerging markets like India, Pakistan, Nigeria and Indonesia that are looking set to knock countries like Britain and the United States out of the top division of smartphone addicted nations in the coming year. We're really starting to see a global presence for outlets like BuzzFeed, um, Huffington Post, a whole, a whole slew of them, Vice and Vox. And we're going to see more of a push into markets such as India, some places in Africa, um, places in South America, um, and just kind of more of a global presence for digital-only media. India's story with the new government, um, um, more economic development, has also attracted a lot of Western media. Um, BuzzFeed India, Huffington Post India, Business Insider India, Quartz India, just to name four entities that have begun this year are covering India in a much more significant way. As a result, Indian audiences have much more choice than they have ever had before. And I think that's um, a healthy trend. One of many trends to watch in the media in the year to come. That's the Listening Post's kickstart for 2015. Next week, it's back to our usual format, monitoring the global media, covering the coverage of news, and questioning dominant narratives that media outlets deliver 
around the world. We'll see you then here at the Listening Post.